financial literacy is not enough. If you are currently consuming a lot of information and learning a lot about money, reading books, listening to podcasts, attending a ton of webinars, consuming, consuming, consuming content with the emphasis on focusing more on literacy, you're missing a huge part of taking care of yourself. I'm Lindsay. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, certified in financial therapy and author of the book, the financial anxiety solution. Let's get into what financial wellness is and why it's so important if you are working on having a better relationship with your money. Financial wellness combines financial literacy or the knowledge of money with how you feel about money. This helps you to actually take action on doing the things that you want to do with your money. In this video, I'm going to talk about how our mental health and money connect and help you take your financial literacy to the next step by talking about financial wellness. The S&P Global Financial Literacy Survey talks about what financial literacy is and provides statistics on what's going on in terms of how well we do or don't understand understand money. They define financial literacy as being able to understand four core concepts about money. Knowledge of interest rates, understanding of how compound interest works and how it works for you and against you depending on what side of the coin you're on. Inflation, and risk diversification. According to the S&P Global Financial Literacy Survey, only one in three adults globally are considered financially literate based on those four core concepts. This is true not only in developing countries, but also in countries with well-developed financial markets. And we know that it's yes about what you know, but it's also about what you have access to. And across the board, what the S&P survey found was that of adults who were able to rank high in financial literacy, they also had access to financial services, things like access to bank accounts, credit cards, loans, and different types of financial products. And what they found is that even for folks who are considered low earners or are considered in poverty, if they have access to things like bank accounts, they tend to be able to score higher on financial literacy surveys. So what we know is yes, knowing things about money is great, but also having access to the services so you can actually take action towards your financial goals is even better. While financial literacy might lead to being better with money, what we also know is you have to actually be able to access those things to be able to apply financial literacy knowledge. To summarize, the way the S&P defines financial literacy is the ability to actually understand those four financial components. And when we think about financial literacy, things like credit scores, budgeting, understanding things like compound interest and inflation, of course those things are important. But what we miss out on is the emotions and the psychology of why we do what we do once we have that information. Again, it's not that financial literacy is bad, it's just that in and of itself, it's not enough for us to take action. In a meta-analysis of over 200 different studies about financial literacy, only 0.1% of the financial behaviors or the financial action taking was actually explained by financial literacy. In other words, knowledge does not equal transformation. And that's why financial wellness is so important because it goes deeper than just knowledge, than just understanding. Financial wellness then is to take those financial literacy concepts, be able to discern what applies to you, what doesn't apply to you, you and to take meaningful action in a sustainable way in ensuring that your emotions are balanced when you're actually engaging with your money. Why? Because upwards of 90% of our money behaviors are driven by how we feel. Anytime somebody tells me, a financial therapist, oh, we have to separate our emotions from our money or we can't make decisions about money based on our emotions, that is a big red flag or a big blazing siren that that is unequivocally wrong because we absolutely make money decisions based on how we feel. So instead of separating our emotions from our money, I encourage us to figure out what our emotions around money are and make wise financial decisions that are in alignment with our emotions, if we're experiencing emotions that are uncomfortable, like anxiety, fear, or scarcity, that we learn how to tend to those emotions around money and make wiser financial decisions. When we ignore our emotions and we go full in on logic, we consume a lot of content. And when we consume a lot of content about money, we listen to all the podcasts, we read all the books, we attend all the webinars, we're following all the influencers, what can end up is a lot of noise in our minds. And when 
we have all of that noise about what to do and what not to do, it can lead to a lot of really uncomfortable emotions. Things like overwhelm, avoidance, embarrassment, shame. And when we have all those things going on, it can be hard to actually quiet down the noise and figure out what type of action we need to take to take wise steps towards moving the needle in a positive direction in our personal finance goals. Even worse than that, when a lot of this noise around personal finance and financial literacy is riddled with, it's your fault that you're in the position that you're in, it makes us feel ashamed and embarrassed and avoid it and not take action at all. And with the pandemic, it's become even more stressful. For people who are in the millennial or Gen Z generation, 68 to 72% of them endorse experiencing financial stress. And to be clear, the stress has been going on for a while, but the pandemic simply pulled the blanket off, so to speak, and really showed us just how stressed we are financially. And when we're stressed about our money, we are not making smart decisions. Think about the last time you were stressed out about what to order at a restaurant, you might have like panic picked a entree that you didn't really want to eat. Similarly with our money, if we're panicked, we're stressed, we're overwhelmed, we're not making really smart decisions. While I can't cover everything in this video, I definitely want to give you five tips that you can start thinking about to help cultivate financial wellness. Tip number one, get curious about your money story. When I say money story, I mean go back in time and think about some of the things that shaped your beliefs about money. I typically recommend going back to kind of elementary school age because what research has found is that by the time we're about seven or eight years old, we have more or less decided what we believe about money and what we think we're allowed to do or not do with our finances. If we go back to what was going on in elementary school, we can start thinking about what were some of the messages that I received about money as a child. They could be direct messages, they could be indirect messages, but all of us have an idea of what was going on and what messages we picked up about money. Think about the household that you were raised in, the school that you attended, the community that you lived in. What was considered normal or abnormal when it came to money? Think about when you went on field trips. Did you have to fundraise or was it a given that your parents would cover it? Or did you live in an area where the taxes covered things like field trips and you didn't even have to think about it? Was money tense in your household? Were your parents or caregivers often kind of walking on eggshells around money? Or were there often arguments about money? Or was it just not a big deal and there were always things kind of coming and going? Were there messages in your household that money is bad or it's the root of all evil or that it's impolite to talk about? Similarly, when there was cash that kind of came into the household that was unexpected, think things like a tax refund or maybe an insurance benefit came into your household. Did that money get spent right away? Did you go on a vacation? Did you buy new shoes? Or was it something that just kind of got fettered away? Then I want you to start painting the picture of what were some of those other big money memories as you were growing up. So yes, elementary school, but then start thinking about what was your first job? Was it expected that you would work as soon as you hit employment age? When you got paid, were you paid under the table or were you paid with a paycheck? When you got that money, were you excited and you spent it all right away or were you excited and went to a bank account and put it in there? Same thing, start thinking about some of these big money milestones as you got older and start to think about what your money story is. And then start to reflect on whether or not that money story is working for you. If you have internalized this idea that money is a taboo and it's not to be talked about, is that helping you? I would imagine if you have internalized this idea that money's taboo and it's bad, you might not have negotiated a raise at work or you might not have thought about how to save ahead because it feels uncomfortable. Now, on the other hand, if you have a money story that sounds like money is here to be spent, you can't take it to the grave, you might be overspending and not really thinking about the consequences. Maybe you're not ending up in credit card debt, but maybe you aren't doing things like saving for an emergency or putting money away in investments for your retirement and for your future self. Start thinking about your money story and ask yourself, is this the money story that I want to continue on in my life? Then I want you to think about money goals that actually matter. Not money goals that you found on Google, not money goals that somebody said you have to do, but the money goals that actually matter to you. Choosing a money goal based on what somebody else says you need to be doing is a recipe for not actually moving toward that money goal. I used to be a proponent of SMART goals, but after last year, I found Emily Lado, who's a disability advocate, I found her take on FUN goals, F-U-N. That stands for flexible, 
uplifting and numberless. Now we're talking about money, so I wanna change that last N to numbers based, but think about money goals that you want to achieve that actually have a why to them. Think, if I want to save up money for an emergency, the why behind that might be that I feel comfortable and confident that if I were to get laid off, that I would have a cushion of a month or two months in savings to help me out. The flexibility piece there could be that I would really love to save up enough in an emergency fund in four months, but if I save up enough in six months, I still feel really good about it. And that good is where the you comes into play, that uplifting. I feel safe, I feel secure, I feel proud having that money. And that numbers-based goal means figuring out what that goal is, dividing it up equally, and auto-saving towards a goal like that. So that's how you can kind of include those fun goals, but make your money goals things that actually matter to you, not that matter to a random person somewhere out in the world. Next, I want you to start feeling good about money. So much of the time, whether I'm working with clients or when I hear from my audience, they are feeling badly about the money mistakes that they made and that shame is kind of hanging over them like a rain cloud. Instead, I want you to start thinking about the ways that money affords you the ability to take care of yourself. If you are kind of stuck in this anxious, avoidant, guilt, scarcity place, I wanna invite you to think about what it would feel like if you just dialed down the temperature or the the intensity on those feelings. Maybe we can't go from anxious to excited in feeling about money, but maybe we can go from anxious to like neutral-ish or anxious to decent when we think about our money. Instead of making those big leaps of I have nothing to I have everything, start creating a bridge for your brain to help you move towards the new way that you want to feel about money. If you're struggling with this prompt, a great way to think about a positive relationship with money is to think about something you've done financially that brought you joy. This could be a purchase that brought you joy, it could be paying down debt, it could be increasing your credit score so you could move out and get a better apartment, but think for a moment about something you've done financially that brought you joy. Asking these types of questions will help you to start seeing what matters to you. What are the values underneath that purchase, that improvement, that debt pay down that tells you a little bit something more about yourself. For example, maybe you feel really good that you spent a good chunk of change on a five course meal with one of your besties. Now, for a lot of people in the personal finance space, they'd be screaming, you can't spend that money, that's wasteful, blah, blah, blah. But if you had the funds to do it and you enjoyed it, I want for you to think about that experience and think about what was underneath that spending that really tells me something important about myself or tells me some of the values that matter to me. Maybe this type of spending, that five course meal at a farm to table restaurant tells you that you really value things like community, connectedness, sustainability, and those types of things you can start kind of latching onto as you start creating a healthier relationship with money or a more positive relationship with money. Now, maybe you're not an experienced person and the thing that came to your mind was a recent pair of running shoes that you bought. And the running shoes allowed you to do a lot of things and you're loving that purchase. And so when we dig under why did the purchase of running shoes really matter to you, it might be in alignment with your values of movement, of getting outdoors, of being in nature, or of the value of your health and well-being. So once we start to figure out what purchases made a difference to us and brought us joy, we can start connecting the dots about what really matters to us and making sure that when possible, we're spending in alignment with those values, knowing that there's no way we can spend 100% in alignment with our values, but dialing down the purchases that do not matter to us. Now get into figuring out your financial landscape. As I mentioned, this is kind of the financial literacy piece of everything, but really figuring out within that realm of financial literacy, where do you fit into that picture? What's going on with your money? Do you know how much money is coming in each month? Do you know how much money you're spending each month? Do you have an idea of how much you want to save for your future self? If we think about it in kind of three different pillars, I tend to think about it as what's going on right now. So that's your income, your expenses. I prefer to call things in this pillar your spending plan, but a lot of people use the term budget, but that's kind of figuring out what's going on right now and having an idea if it's working for you. Then in the short-term goal category, that second pillar, I want for you to think about things like 
like an emergency fund or a rainy day fund or an FU fund, whatever you want to call it. Do you have a little cushion there to help you out if you were in a financial bind? Also in that middle pillar are short term goals, things like saving up a down payment for a new apartment or things like saving up for a vacation, those short term goals. Do you have a plan that supports those short term goals? And then finally, in that last column, this is the column that I find gets really, really noisy, but it's thinking about your future self. It could be everything from saving up for retirement, paying down debt, making sure that you have things in place like a will, trust, life insurance, thinking about long term care, either for yourself or for an aging parent. And if you're a person who has kids, thinking about what you do or don't want to do financially as they age. Do you want to be thinking about paying for them for higher education or supporting them in some way? All of that's going to go into that category. To recap, when you think about your financial landscape, think about what's going on now, what needs to change to feel a little bit better or what's going really well that you can double down on. What are the things that are kind of going on in the near future? Things like an emergency fund, short-term savings goals, and then thinking, to the future, what are the things that matter to me and how am I taking care and investing in my future self? Tip number five to cultivating financial wellness is find your people. Even 10, 15 years ago, it was really hard to find people that were talking about money in an open, a transparent, and a shame-free way. Nowadays, you can find a host of people who have shared identities or shared values to find people who get where you're coming from because one thing that matters so much, regardless of the type of goal we're working towards, is feeling like we are seen, feeling like we are valid, and feeling like we matter. And when we're moving towards money goals, so often we're doing them all in a vacuum. And so how Having other people in our corner can be really, really helpful. Contrary to the do-it-yourself, be independent noise, 64% of people, according to a recent HR study, said that they wanted help understanding their finances. Getting help, whether it's from a community or from a financial planner, is huge in moving the needle towards cultivating financial wellness. I love turning toward online communities personally because the odds are greater that you're going to find your community of people. And when I say your community of people, I mean getting really specific about where you fit in the financial landscape and finding other people who have similar backgrounds. It could be things like finding first gen folks. It could be finding other people who have an interest in retiring early. It could be finding other people like me who are dual income, no kids, but finding people who have similar identities, similar values and similar goals can help you feel supported and lifted as you move towards achieving your financial wellness goals. Plus, when we think about the community aspect, it's also super helpful in finding access and resources. Remember earlier when I said that financial literacy is great, but we also have to have access to the different types of products and services needed to actually be able to implement the knowledge that we've learned about financial literacy. Having these online communities is great because oftentimes people are really generous about sharing the resources that have worked for them. Things like high yield savings accounts available in online banks or apps that round up to the next dollar to automatically help you save. You never know what resources might be available out there and finding communities that are like-minded or of similar identities can really help you get access to those resources to take that knowledge that you've learned in financial literacy and move towards your financial wellness. I would love to know if you have an online community that helps uplift you and support you and move you towards your financial goals, drop them in the comments below. It's a great way to kind of share the wealth and share the resources that are available out there. To recap the five different tips to start moving towards financial wellness, it is get curious about your money story, set money goals that matter to you using that fun goal acronym, Three, start feeling good about money. Four, understand your financial landscape. And finally, figuring out a community that matters to you. Again, make sure to comment there and I'll see you in the next video.